infrastructure initially physical and now digital were the cornerstone of the annual Africa 50 general shareholders meeting in Rwanda's capital, Kigali. Come, brothers and sisters from all ends of Africa. Come, I tell you, you do not want to miss this. Come, come and gather in the common square, let us tell you. Come, brothers and sisters from all over Africa. Are you here? I do not hear you. Are you here? Come on, can I hear you? Can I hear you some more? Are you here? Are you here to hear of our great land? Thank you. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you to the 2019 General Shareholders Meeting of Africa 50 Project Development and Africa 50 Project Finance. Welcome to the General Shareholder Meetings of Africa 50. We are grateful, Your Excellency, the Prime Minister, to President Paul Kagame and the government of Rwanda that you lead for hosting these General Shareholders Meetings of Africa 50 in this beautiful city of Kigali. As a continent, we need to create, shape, and own our agenda when it comes to innovation and technology, among others. This journey will require us to invest across multiple dimensions, from connectivity in rural and urban areas, to digital literacy, to increase adoption and to prepare our young people to be successful in a, in a digital world. In Rwanda, we have started with laying the foundation by investing in infrastructure that led to 95% country fiber network coverage. I want to thank Africa 50 for bringing this conference to Rwanda. Africa, 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 Africa. Today is our ancestors' dream lived in you, sons and daughters of this great continent, moving us past the edges, past the boundaries once drawn for us past the images of an uncivilized Africa. See, come, let me show you, let me walk you down memory lane. Do you remember that story? I trekked 14 kilometers to school every day, bare feet. See, be grateful, my child, though. I was, I only had one pair of clothing, one pair like this. And how about clothing? The only water source in the village was the river. But that's, that's a story for another day. day. A few years ago, a dream was born in Africa for Africans. A vision to transform Africa's infrastructure Africa. began to grow. The light of the world, but so much I might say to you. Africa. Your children are the light of today. Your children, yes, they call it. Okay, let me start by saying that I am not an innovation hubs expert, and today you will not get uh, an innovation hubs powwow. So if you can go to the next slide, I wanted to focus on three main slides. The first is to say that if we continue at the rate that we're going, we are deindustrializing as a continent, and we are going to get millions and millions of young people who are unemployed. And that is an immediate danger and urgency that we have. Uh, next slide. And the other big thing is that we are not investing in research and development. I know that this is an infrastructure group, uh, but the gap that we have in skills today, uh, based on the investments that we're currently making in research and development, is about 97%. So I'm here to give you some optimism, but also some realism. Next slide. So we do have some positive news, which is that we have growing number of hubs across the continent. Um, and we have a lot of money that can be made, 60 trillion, that can come from just the digital economy and the kind of payment systems that we're looking at. So, Alan, I think it's fitting if we follow from what Faith has put on the tables that we are opening up Africa. It was mentioned earlier that the uh, free trade continent trade area 
uh, has been, in, well, is in operation effectively now. Two, two days ago, um, we got the go ahead. It's uh, now blazing ahead. Is the, how's that going to change up the game? Because leveraging the regional and creating this continent-wide $3.3 trillion economy, which actually gives us the largest economy in the world if we do manage to, to open it up across uh, people, goods, and services. How is that going to help in terms of really putting us on the global stage? Yeah, no, I think it's a very important point. I'd like to build on what uh, Fit said. And, and Rwanda is also showing an example, although there's still the work that needs to be done in terms of uh, uh, allowing the free flow of people, uh, talent, to, to come and help uh, build this continent. Uh, and I think this is so important. Uh, and uh, the way we are helping uh, uh, on our side at Africa 50, uh, we are not necessarily uh, funding uh, uh, education uh, um, uh, programs, uh, although a sister organization, the African Development Bank, is doing so. But I think DFI should focus on, on that, building talent, but also advising government to make sure that they're able to attract a bit more people. Now, uh, what we are doing, uh, which will enable uh, the African uh, continental free trade area to work a bit better, we are working on building uh, infrastructure that will connect uh, countries. It could be uh, ICT infrastructure, uh, cables, uh, that are continented-wide cable, but also we have a flagship project that we are doing today, uh, which is a key link that are connecting two countries in Africa, but also uh, that will be a link to connect uh, uh, many other countries. This is the Congo, uh, two Congo Bridge project where you're connecting two countries, so connectivity is really the name of the game to make sure that you have infrastructure that allows this continent to really to function as one single entity. This is so important uh, because uh, that will also give incentive to global companies to come here and uh, because they will see the big market. Uh, so totally agree with what uh, Faith said. Uh, now, we at Africa 50 are focused on that. Uh, we, of course, cannot do <laughs> everything. We have to focus on some sectors. But I can tell you that the, the, the sense that innovation, uh, ICT infrastructure is so important, uh, almost forced us uh, to move slightly towards a, a zone that we hadn't targeted before, which is digital uh, infrastructure, a bit more ICT. We're gonna be big on broadband. We're gonna make sure that we increase substantially the penetration rate of broadband in Africa. You cannot think about the fourth industrial revolution if you don't have internet access, which is almost universal. So that is one piece that we're gonna uh, uh, push very hard. A fin final point, this is very important. We are deploying that's what we're doing in Kigali Innovation City Project together with uh, the minister here and Claire and their teams. Uh, early stage risk capital to work with government entities and others to develop those innovations, uh, well, in this case, Kigali Innovation City, but to come in, in the early stage instead of saying to government, please go ahead and develop this thing and then we come later once uh, you've proved the concept. We want to be part of proving that concept and we're taking the risk and this is one of the things that Africa 50 can do. Natalie, if we can bring you in here, you, you're leading the scientific agenda across the African continent and throwing forward to the Science and Innovation Conference that you will be holding in March 2020 in Nairobi, still within the East African context. Um, talk to me about other innovation hubs and the changes that you've seen them make to the economies with which in they are placed. I think uh, we, we're seeing a, a peripheral we are seeing many innovation hubs, and I would even say ecosystems um, uh, beyond just innovation hubs. And I think that's, the, I think the point of um, my presentation was to show that innovation hubs uh, come into plug and play uh, when there's an environment that allows it to prosper. And it, uh, I think the going from just having innovation hubs by name, but seeing uh, companies, technologies that can be scaled up become industries uh, that bring in employment, which is also a very important part. We are not seeing enough of uh, startups creating large scale employment. So we have to, what, as the minister was saying, we have to really think through and I want to commend the government of Rwanda for that, for thinking through what, is, what are all the elements we need to be able to have an innovation city that creates long-term industries and employment, and what do we need to do? And as you can see, people who go to 
you know, uh, startups or uh, innovators who go to innovation hubs are at very different scales. You have someone who's coming to figure out their idea to prove their concept. There are others who are coming in because they've proven their concept and they're looking for financing or they're looking for research and development. They're looking for different things. And so what, what we need to do today is to have a more, uh, if we're thinking of from the Africa 50 perspective, we need to really look at as uh, Faith was saying, innovation, or at least uh, those who are doing research, when they are looking uh, to scale up ideas, they need that freedom to be able to uh, test out ideas, fail quickly, uh, try up some ideas, use their idea for another industry. And that requires an innovation ecosystem where they can pull from researchers, they can pull from engineers, they can pull from financing, they can pull from people who allow them to fail. And in Africa, we do not yet have that environment, even though we use the buzzwords. We do not yet have that environment where people will say, I'm in going to invest a, a fund that does this specifically, that allows people to draw money, prove their concept, maybe fail, draw some more money. That doesn't exist, and the banks are not going to be there. So we need some gaps. Uh, um, uh, organizations and funds that, ga that will be that stopgap uh, so that uh, startups can actually flourish. The second thing I was going to say is that a lot of what we're missing in Africa is tech transfer. So we run uh, centers of excellence across Africa and we graduate masters and PhD students in machine learning, in AI, as well as mathematical sciences, which is the foundation of all technology. And what we, we find is that our students are scientists. They're not trained, they're not business development people, they're not bankers, they don't know how to do a business plan. And so what we need to do is strengthen, not just for our own centers of excellence, what we're doing now is, is creating tech transfer offices, but we need to strengthen tech transfer offices across Africa. Uh, we see that in South Africa it's just starting, where you allow students who already have the technological background to be able to start companies uh, and scale up, and that's what created Silicon Valley. And so if we are trying to become Silicon Valley, we have to fix that gap. As our CEO said this morning, that's part of the reason that Africa 50 has decided to focus on this one solution for last mile connectivity, to see if we can galvanize other ideas, solutions from entrepreneurs, uh, business people, uh, people doing research and development, engineers, um, but also people who are doing capacity building and digital literacy to see whether we can come up with a whole system solution that can help Africa with this issue of last mile connectivity. Where do we get the money from? How do we spend it? Which are the key sectors? Now, these are some of the questions that were asked at the Africa 50 Summit here in Kigali, Rwanda. And our speakers today had lots of answers regarding investing in infrastructure for Africa's growth, Agenda 2063. And of course, we had two new members joining the Africa GSM shareholders. Well, um, the, we had two exciting things that um, actually happened. One is that Zimbabwe uh, became the latest uh, um, you know, shareholder. Um, they joined Africa 50, so that brings it to 28, uh, 28 countries. Um, you know, uh, our goal is to make sure that you know, Africa 50 has 54 countries uh, that are going to be members of it. But we are in the right, uh, right direction. The lack of enough bankable projects and rather not the lack of funding were noted as some of the major challenges faced by many of the potential investors on the continent. Our customers can transact on the phone or on internet, which is way more efficient for us than serving people on, on the branches. So this has enabled many, many people. But if you look at the fact that the connectivity gap is still very much there. Because if we say only 50%, about 50% of our people are connected, we need to have everyone connected. And this requires a lot of financing in the last mile uh, connectivity. And as, as bankers, we are, this is not very much a, a question of technology because technology is there, it's time tested, it's available. We just need entrepreneurs to take up the opportunity and say, let's develop new business models, things like uh, public Wi-Fi. Uh, today with uh, AC Group, we, we have already connectivity in buses uh, in the city and uh, also up country. We are looking for entrepreneurs that will look at this as an opportunity because we all agree that if we have people, more people connected, it will have a very big impact on uh, productivity of these people and uh, ultimately on also economic growth and the GDP growth of this country. I mean, you're CEO of AC Group. Uh, you've done some incredible things, it seems, here in digitalizing payment systems for transportation. You've seen a reduction in accidents and more efficiency on the roads. And I know you're also working in other African countries. So you're a domestic investor. Does your experience say match what 
we've just heard you know, from, from, from a, a Robin. Is it the same thing? And what specifically has made it possible for you to be successful as a domestic investor? Sure, so um, <clears throat> thank you. I, I don't think I can answer this question without giving um, live examples um, in the different years as we, as we went along. Um, before we had a massive investment that, that we put in public transport, we were a startup, a um, run and startup. And at the time when we started, um, we were competing with another Swedish giant that's in the same space, um, together with um, another Korean company. <clears throat> now we get into the room, we're very, um, you know, startup, two people um, in t-shirts, and across the table there is um, six gentlemen in suits and ties with a very, very nice presentation, um, and that's your competition. Um, you know, you look at their presentation and you also, you know, say, yeah, this is actually really good. But um, the regulator gave us an equal chance and said, let's, let's, let's try this. And um, we started, and um, by the time our competitors were signing the MOU, we were almost at 20, 30% uh, market share. And the regulator was deliberate and saying, let's give um, a Rwandan company a chance. Now, at the time when we started also, there was no regulation um, in uh, the regulator as um, policies and regulations that covered the kind of service that we were providing. But that didn't hold us back. They gave us an objection and said, look, um, get started, and we'll um, catch up as time goes on. And that's one of the challenges that uh, many African um, countries face when it comes to innovation. They, there will never be a time where innovation will be moving at the pace, um, where policy will be moving at the pace of innovation. Innovation will always be way ahead. But we shouldn't hold back um, innovation as governments, um, policy makers. We should always create um, an environment, which um, many call a sandbox, where innovation can, can start and you know, prosper, and then the regulation um, can, can catch up, which um, the Rwandan government has done very well. I think um, Claire and Guy have you know, spoken about it. Um, much later, when we're looking at um, other products, um, still, you know, the government is able to call the different stakeholders. For example, I spoke about our project, um, you know, retrofitting cars from, um, you know, uh, diesel and uh, petrol to LPG gas, which is cleaner, is cheaper, um, you know, makes the car more efficient. Um, but that requires infrastructure that's outside the scope of what we want to do. And so that's requiring, that's talking about petrol stations and um, changing some of the infrastructure. So the government can also bring um, all the stakeholders that you need on board. Um, when it comes to raising investment, uh, massive investment for certain projects, the government can also step in when it comes to negotiating with um, credit institutions, which is um, valuable. So in a nutshell, I would say the government is, of Rwanda is almost like um, a shareholder that just doesn't take um, dividends. So they're always there um, when you need them. You can sit across the table and negotiate. Um, I, 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 you know, most panels, I always joke about a conversation I had with Minister Paula who spoke earlier. Um, at some point, you know, I, I was disturbing her so much with something that we needed, and I apologized um, and said, you know, I'm, I'm sorry for bothering you this much. And she said, don't be sorry. I'm paid to be disturbed, um, which, which is a very unique, uh, you know, case that you'd not find in many other um, countries. But again, when it comes to expanding outside Rwanda, um, it's something that the government of Rwanda also assists with and is very deliberate. Um, when there is, you know, a particular conference and we have um, government officials traveling, you know, they carry, you know, um, flyers and information about different companies. When they see an opportunity, when they meet someone that could be a potential partner, they're able to loop you in. Um, and when you meet them to say thank you for connecting me to this person, they actually have someone else for you. So that um, is, is, is so beneficial for a growing um, company, especially because on the continent, we still don't have one single company that has footprint in all countries, or in even 80% of the countries. So the opportunities to grow are, are, are enormous. Now, Christelle, you run Water Access Rwanda. You've provided potable water to about 100,000 Rwandans today. Your population of 12.2 million. How are you going to take it from where it is today to covering the entire country? That's your vision. And what, again, is it about Rwanda? You've given us some good examples, Patrick, of what the government is doing to support. But what are you seeing that's going to help you get there? And what has already helped you get there? 
be very specific. Thank you. Um, just to correct you a little bit, our vision is not to cover just Rwanda, but Dreaming all of Sub-Saharan Africa. <laughs> So um, just to uh, share a little bit about what we do. So we install mini uh, or microgrids, depending on how you call them. We go in rural areas where uh, a lot of donors or traditional NGOs have left abandoned hand pump boreholes because apparently rural areas can only be serviced by that. And then we remove the old hand pumps, add solar, create kiosk systems so that people even in the most remote areas on islands in um, underpopulated villages can have access to water in their homes. This saves billions of hours from time that women, children are wasting collecting water every day. But beyond that, we're helping unlock a very big market. So Africans right now consume less water than anyone else uh, on the planet Earth. So we consume less than 40 liters per person per day when the actual minimum uh, for us to be healthy is 50 liters. Um, instead of seeing that as a need or you know, bringing donor money, we need to see that as a business opportunity. So by giving, if every African right now consumes an extra 10 liters that they're buying and it's clean, it's purified, we not only save governments a lot of money and create other business opportunities, but we're, that's a lot of money to be made. Tapping into a potential three trillion US dollar Africa free continental trade area market is key on the Africa 50 agenda. Uh, one thing which is now very clear is that all of our African leaders, they have acknowledged the fact that government shareholders, governments will not be able to bridge the infrastructure gap alone. We need to significantly increase the volume of private investment in infrastructure. That is the piece where Africa 50 uh, is helping and, and we continue to help, we continue to do more. So we reviewed with our shareholders uh, some of the projects that we are already doing, a very specific project, uh, including one project here in Rwanda, which is the Kigali Innovation City project, which Africa 50 has been selected by uh, uh, Rwanda government as, uh, as uh, the co-developer with Rwanda Development Bank and also the Ministry of ICT. And uh, it's uh, one of the reasons, uh, but there are many other reasons why i like to thank uh, His Excellency President Kagame for the support that he provides to Africa 50, and also his entire government, Prime Minister Girante was here today. And with uh, our shareholders, uh, we discussed a number of other projects across the continent. Uh, we can go through uh, some of those projects, but maybe I mentioned one or two of the projects that we've discussed. Uh, there is a second uh, two Congo Bridge project, which will link Kinshasa and Brazzaville, which is a flagship project that uh, we're working together with the African Development Bank. I, I think it's been touched upon multiple times, but I think that the largest gap is the tech talent gap, um, especially you want people that have startup experience and not just programming, but product management, business development, go to market strategy uh, and the whole thing. And um, I'll give so, you- So this is clearly lack of skills. Yes, but now a potential solution is that um, we can take the long route with investing in education for the next 10 to 15 years. And in 20 years, one African city might be on the top 20 um, hub ecosystem. Another potential solution is to open up Africa, which we've already started to do, um, not just for other Africans, but really for global talent to, to move here easily and start to work. And not just um, visas on arrivals and um, free work permits, but also real incentives, equity in what we're doing, equity in Africa, because this is the future in many ways. So um, I, I think this is how we can balance developing today and then also invest in developing tomorrow with our own local talent. But we need to pair people together. And this is kind of um, the area I see opportunity in. A general shareholders meeting ended on a high with many of the panelists over the two days proposing justified solutions for Africa's progress. Secondly, is that the African Development Bank um, is, you know, we, we, we help to, to set up Africa 50, we promote Africa 50, we believe in Africa 50, and we will continue to give Africa 50 significant amount of support. And uh, I was delighted that today, the uh, African Development Bank uh, signed uh, additional subscriptions uh, to promote project development because uh, the development of project is always where the challenge really is on the continent. And we feel that uh, you know, getting bankable projects, it's the problem. Money is not the, the real problem. It's, the, it's getting bankable project that's really the problem. So those are two major things that, uh, that happened today. 
So much on my set. Africa. Your children is the light of the Africa. skies. Your children is the color of the world. Africa. Africa, you're the light of the Africa. world. There's so much on my set. Africa. Your children is the light of the Africa. world. Africa, Africa, Africa. Africa. 